This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and struggles. I share what to eat and how to move and how to think to get the energy and the vitality that you want in the second and better half. And today is all about how to stick to your exercise plan. If you find it so easy to start and so hard to stick to your exercise plan, then this is for you. The saying goes that the hardest thing is to start. That, my friend, is a lie. The hardest thing is not to finish, however. The hardest thing is the middle. The getting up every morning early after the honeymoon period is worn off. The doing more laundry than your sedentary self would ever have to do. Having to choose exercise over some other things in your life. And having to convince your friends or your family that this is something you're not willing to sacrifice. All of that happens in the middle, and that's the hardest. If you're about to the finish line in a race, or you're just doing your own walk or run or swim, it's easy at first, and you have a burst of energy, and an I could have done more at the end. But the middle is where it's the hardest. It's where those little voices creep in. It's like, why am I doing this again? And it's like, okay, I've already gotten my heart rate up. So why don't I just stop? I don't have to do more because nobody is making you do it, right? This short post is all about how to stick to your exercise plan. I've been dwelling on this recently because it's fall. Kind of like change of seasons. We're going to recommit. We're going to get started again, get back to routine. And I'll link to a recent podcast about how I personally do it. After I delivered it, though, I felt like there was something missing. The tools to actually do it and nail down why you might be like so many of my students and private coaching clients having a hard time. So there are three things that really need to change to stick to your exercise plan. Let's dive into them. And yet, before I do, this is a shameless plug for the sponsor of this episode, my new strength training program, Stronger. No matter what else your goals are, avoiding disease or getting off medication, boosting your mood and energy, avoiding osteoporosis, or just loving life more because you're well, stronger, It is a built for women 50 and over strength training program. It's everything you need and nothing you don't. If you have limited time, but you want to start and not get overwhelmed, check it out right now while I'm recording. We start October 1st and you can register for Stronger right now if If you're listening by chance to this recording after it's been newly released, you can still, even though the doors are closed, find out how to be the first to be notified when we open the doors again. And the juicy incentive there is there is usually an early, early bird rate for fast action takers because I know it's so easy to procrastinate. So when we first open doors, you'll have an opportunity to get in at the lowest rate you're ever going to see. Right now, we're in the early bird rate. So it's a little bit better if you use Stronger 25 to register. And the link to do that will be in the show notes. And that is flipping50.com forward slash get stronger. And you can find a few more details and you can find some great stories from three short videos from our recent participants about what they benefited from during the program and after and why they liked it, what was unique about it. So you can hear it in their words and not mine. Weight training is about so much more than getting your muscles stronger. You'll know it when you experience the magic of other women supporting you inside the Stronger Group. So now let's dive into these three things you want to change in order to stick to your exercise plan. These obstacles will have to go. Number one, you have fictitious obstacles that are limiting your ability to stick to it. And they are really your limiting beliefs and your personal rules. I think we all have these. 
but you know, it's like you come in after work and the optimal time for you to exercise if you haven't is right then before you get into cooking dinner or before you at least sit down to dinner. And yet, you know, you look around your house or maybe you work at home, which I think is even worse because I have a home office and I so get it. I can see piles of things everywhere. There's always something else I could be doing except for exercise or in the way of exercise. So maybe for you, it's you have to do the laundry first or you have to do the dishes first or you have to get supper on the table by X and you fill in the bank. You have to do a full hour or even 45 minutes or, or 30 instead of taking advantage of the 10 or 20 minutes that you actually have. You're tired, so you should sleep in. You can't lift or walk or swim. You fill in the blank there on your activity because maybe you've got an injury or you've just had some little mole removed or (laughs) you've got some excuse. And so you can't do that thing, so you're not going to do anything. You have to leave the house clean before vacation or you have to unpack before you do anything else when you get home. You found all these little rules that, you know, until that's done, I can't do this. And yet, who says, right? Who says? Just you. Just that little voice inside of your head. But there really are no rules. I want to tell you a secret about creativity and productivity. Some of the most productive and creative people out there There have actually been studies that look at, you know, what are their traits and habits, and they will have, and I say they, I should actually say we, we will have the messiest cars and desks, and that probably flows to the rest because I'm sitting here at my dining room, quote unquote, desk, because the window light is so much better than my actual desk. I'm looking around my entire living room and pantry. It's a mess. It really is. If somebody walked in this door, they would think, oh my gosh. (laughs) And that runs through my head. It's like, ah, I can't invite people over here because I like have this little studio set up in my living room and I have piles of things on my dining room table. So where would people sit to eat or talk? And you know, what what's true of people who are really creative is that is okay and we are we tend to be perfectionists creative people do we don't look like it on the exterior but we're perfectionists to the fact that or the extent that like I'm not going to clean my car unless I can do it like a hundred percent so I'm not going to just like go wash it because I'm thinking well I'm not going to vacuum it I'm not going to take the time to do that I'm not going to like clean the seats and dust it and do that. So why bother? So literally, I haven't been through a car wash probably for over three months and I drive on uh, gravel roads and dirt roads up here in the mountains. So you can guess, right? And and I haul a dog in the back seat. And I, you know, constantly have bike gear. Um, and so it's a mess. But that's a limiting belief that it's got to be perfect in order to do something. So actually, definitely, I'm going to go for a run before I'm going to do anything to my car. But, you know, if you've got limiting beliefs about what your house should look like or what that needs to look like, I mean, look at those and ask yourself, who says, right? I mean, who says that's true? Number two is not really an obstacle unless you don't know. So if you don't know your numbers, you're not measuring the right thing. You need to know your numbers. And I am not just talking about the long time statement or mantra of the American Heart Association. Know your numbers, meaning know your cholesterol levels, know your HDL and your LDL, know your blood pressure, because those are all pointing to your risk factors. But in addition to that, what you really need to know is not just the number on the scale. You need to know your inches and your percent body fat. And be sure that is not the same as BMI, that is body mass index. That's only a factor of your height and your weight. 
that tells you nothing about really your fitness level, which is determined by the amount of muscle mass and the amount of fat mass. Looking at the two of those is what's really important. And here's the deal. When you pre-benchmark, you pre-test before you begin a program, you, you document your weight, your measurements, your body composition. And maybe you also go to blood pressure, cholesterol, resting heart rate. Maybe as a woman in midlife, you also look at what's happening with your hormone levels, your cortisol, your insulin. You also look a little bit deeper at what's going on with your thyroid hormones and look at your adrenal fatigue or risk for it. You're looking at progesterone and testosterone and, of course, estrogen. Looking at all of those can give you a much more comprehensive picture of, is my exercise working? You know immediately whether what you're doing, whether that's the number of workouts you do or you don't do, the weight plus the inches and the body fat are telling you exactly whether what you're doing is working for you or not. Is it improving your numbers or is it pushing further away from the direction you want to go? And yes, exercise is medicine. Exercise can positively influence your blood pressure, cholesterol, your resting heart rate, your hormone balance or imbalance as much or potentially equally to medications or to supplementation. So you definitely want to be tracking those numbers not just saying, well, I'm randomly, you know, I'm exercising and it still isn't helping. It may be the way you're exercising. Just exercising is kind of like, that's a just out there. That is better than being on the couch for sure. But if you have a very specific goal, you need very specific exercise that helps and targets that goal. All of those are going to help you see evidence that what you're doing does matter, even if that scale doesn't change. And sticking with it in part is feeling like you've at least thrown yourself a bone. You have evidence you're going in the right direction. Another number might be how many hours of sleep you're getting or how many hours of sleep you would qualify as great hours of sleep. Number three, another obstacle that you really need to fix in order to benefit most from exercise is you know, stop hiding behind somebody or something else, you know, thinking you have to work, right? Or somebody else at work, a colleague, a coworker, your boss might be looking, you know, and the truth is we all work such, such different hours and we work differently optimally, right? So we could say that, you know, you might work best in really short sprints with a lot of breaks between and get way more done than someone else potentially could, you know, in those short sprints. But it's how you're productive that you really need to pay attention to. And so just because somebody's working and putting in more hours doesn't mean they're doing any better than you. So you've got to listen to those voices. Another one is your kids need you. So you can't exercise. You couldn't take time for yourself because your kids need you, right? And yet, you know, think about that. <laughs> Don't kids also need to you know, be on their own and learn how to entertain themselves? And do they really need you, right, when they've got so many electronics or they've got so many activities? Finding a way that you can get to the point where your kids do need you. They need you healthy. They actually need you to be a role model for how you take care of yourself because that is how they will take care of themselves. Do you want to fast forward them 30 years or 40 years from now, depending on your age and theirs, and have them be in, in the exact same place you are if you're having a hard time sticking with it? Reversing that might help you stick with it. Another one is your spouse doesn't like it. You know, when you're doing something else and maybe your spouse is not that into changing habits for healthier right now. And it can be hard if you're going to spend some of the time you used to spend with that significant other doing something for yourself. It feels a little bit like you might be outgrowing them or they might feel a little threatened that you're doing this and not spending time with them. But really think about whether those are your own thoughts or it is a reality. 
And, and in that case, you might need to sit down and have a talk about how your spouse significant other benefits, right? When you feel better and feel better about yourself and potentially that you're doing for them as much as for you. If any of these things has resonated, I just want to summarize them one more time. These are three that really stick out. And if you've got another one, I would love to hear it. So please drop it into the comments. But these three things really need to change. You've got to get rid of those fictitious obstacles, your limiting beliefs, your personal rules about, you know, what order, what time, how things have to happen. You know, instead of doing the laundry, or maybe you do it, you throw it in the wash, you throw it in the dryer, and maybe it doesn't get folded. <laughs> and that's okay if you got your exercise in. You know, which one is going to be talked about at your funeral, right? She never folded laundry, right? <laughs> Probably not. You know, she lived with so much energy, and she was constantly, you know, on the move and happy and, you know, thriving in good health. That may be something somebody talks about. The second one is you really need to know your numbers. Not knowing those numbers can actually keep you doing things that are not even productive. So you may be guilting yourself over not being very active over things that you shouldn't be really dwelling on anyway. So when you know your numbers, it's much easier to sit down and then think, okay, what do I do in my exercise that really will change the needle here, and I don't necessarily mean on the scale, but in terms of you know changing your inches, your percent body fat, improving your sleep, reducing your stress, changing your appetite. Some kinds of exercise increase appetite. The right kind of exercise doesn't. In fact, it will reduce it. And the third thing is stop hiding behind somebody else. You're telling yourself potentially that your boss, you know, doesn't want you to, to exercise or take a break. And in fact, most bosses, good ones, you know, who have gotten to that point because they are productive and creative, actually value exercise and value that you're taking care of yourself and you know how to get your work done in good time or that your kids need you, your spouse doesn't like it. I mean, really check those things out. Is it true or just your limiting beliefs. I would so appreciate you leaving a rating in iTunes. It really helps us spread the word about the possibilities you and I have in changing the way we ate. And it helps to shunt women with hormone imbalances away from standard exercise prescriptions that don't fit their needs. I'll leave a link below. And if you have a question, please leave it below the show link at flipping50.com. I love hearing from you. And then again, if this episode was helpful, your rating in iTunes makes a huge difference. And then share it with a friend. Surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. To get the most from this week's episode, you can go to the show notes for the blog. So if you like to listen or or if you'd like to read more, you can get all the show notes at flipping50.com forward slash podcast. And if there are any juicy downloads or links like to our stronger program, you'll find that there too. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 together.